Namaste and a very warm welcome. Yet another beautiful episode on Impact Leaders with Simply Suparna featuring Sabera Awardees. We have an impactful leader here again, but as is cursory, I'd like to start by invoking the higher power. Shakti has held me in good stead, and I'd like to start by reciting the Saraswati Vandana. Ya Kundendu Tushar Haradha Vila, Ya Shubhrivastra Vrita, Ya Veena Varadanda Manditakara, Ya Shweta Padamasana. Ya Brahmachutta Shankar Prabhuti Bhi, Devai Sada Vandita, Samam Patu Saraswati, Bhagavati Nishesh, Jagya Paha. My guest today is a seasoned professional with experience in sustainable development, and one can say he has been a pioneer in the sustainable design sector. He works with, of course, design, um, ecological restoration, and his journey with Good Earth has been marked by a commitment to sustainability, a commitment that has been acknowledged by the Sabera Awards by um, bestowing on them a responsible business trophy in the year 2022. Thank you so much, Prashant, for taking the time for doing this for us. Thank you, Sapuna. Thank you. Nice to, nice to be here. <laughs> Interesting, uh, the little conversation that we're having uh, before we actually went live, the fact that you uh, went into sustainable design and sustainability much before sustainability or even CSR became a buzzword. So what was your trigger to get into this sector? Yeah, I think so when I so I did my master's in the US and I did my master's in construction management and in the US, I think lead and sustainability was already a buzzword when I, when I went there. And when I kind of looked at it, I felt it's a great kind of place. To, so I actually did my thesis, which kind of linked India to how India would kind of look at sustainability, how we could leapfrog, you know, learning certain uh, designs or principles, which, uh, you know, the US or, or the other Western countries had kind of followed. And when I did actually did do my study, I realized that a lot of the work we have doing, been doing for the last 30, 40 years or even traditional systems here was already sustainable. So that kind of pushed us towards, but people still needed because we were trying to kind of, all of our development was moving towards the Western, you know, we were looking at glass boxes, we we're looking at more concrete structures. So I thought, you know, once I come back here, you know, how do we kind of, uh, you know, work with the, you know, work with the firm or work with people who kind of look at sustainability from it in, its, in a truer sense, in a more holistic sense. That was my, you know, how I kind of got into good earth. You know, it's mind boggling to me sometimes when I walk down, uh, you know, uh, the streets in Gurgaon, the cyber hub here in the Delhi NCR region. And now also uh, close to follow up is the Noida region in, in Delhi as well. The glass buildings, like you mentioned, they're coming up galore. And I wonder in a tropical country like India, I mean, how does that, you know, amount to sustainability and yet when you have to look good on paper, they manage to somehow. What is your take on it? No, I think, I mean, I, mean, I, I was talking to you about a similar thing, right? I mean, so we can do a really bad building or not a bad building, but a glass box, which is like you said, rightly said it in a climate like ours, it's the worst thing because you're getting in more heat into the building and during summer, you end up doing a lot more cooling, uh, which you may do energy star rated AC and get points for it and get some lead ratings out of it. but. From our take, I think we have to stay true to our, you know, our place. Like, you know, if you just look, go a little bit further before we started looking at the Western buildings, you just follow, I mean, like you, we do a lot of brick buildings. So brick is a great material. It's local material. So kind of looking at vernacular, like, you know, look at local material, look at local people and just follow, you know, what we've been doing, you know, before all these things came in and that would, that should kind of, you know, cater to a lot of your problems. I mean, climate change is becoming big in India. So, you know, and we are contributing to all of these things by building all these alien structures. It is alien, you know, in a, in a geological context. So how do we maybe just sticking to our roots, sticking to our traditions, but also being contemporary about it. I mean, we, we still have to cater to, you know, what people want. So there is a fine line which we can kind of design and make it interesting and make it, you know, sustainable. So you were acknowledged for uh, the Malhar Eco Village. Uh, right. That was a project as part of Good Earth. I want to understand from you the details on that. How did that? How did that come about? Because what is important to understand is that Sabera also recognizes businesses who are responsible, and you were, uh, you know, acknowledged with the responsible business uh, trophy. Uh, because unless businesses you know, find it in their good um, uh, intent to be able to bring about an impactful change. 
things will not happen because nothing drives better uh, anyone except for profit. And if you can align that profit with a good intent, I think that's right. where sustainable change can actually happen because then businesses can become a force of good. And that's the whole idea behind responsible business acknowledgement, which has become an extremely coveted trophy now over the years with Sabera. So right. Sint, do tell us a little bit about this eco-village. Yeah, so I think uh, I, 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 my journey with Good Earth actually started with building Malhar itself. So 2010 is when we started Malhar. And Good Earth, at, until that point of time, had built a lot of smaller communities. And at that point of time, we felt there is a need to do like an eco-village, you know, kind of integrate all of the learnings we've learned. So Good Earth, per se, started its journey in 1985. So they had a lot of work with Laurie Baker, you know, having looking at Mahatma Gandhi and his principles of decentralization. So a lot of those things kind of trickle down into their designs and how they looked at design and development. And, so, and when we felt it, if it has to make an impact, we have to do something bigger. So we were all doing smaller parcels. So we thought, let's look at Malhar itself, like a, like a 50 acre development. So look at it from a fundamental perspective, like, you know, are we looking at water, carrying capacity? So you look at the land and understand what it can take. So we started that journey and then also looked at, from the development perspective, we looked at how we can cater to all kinds of, all starters of society. We don't want to create, um, you know, a classist or a kind of a siloed uh, thing. So we had projects varying from 35 lakhs all the way up to, you know, a, a crore and a half. So we also wanted to make sure there's diversity in kind of what kind of product we give in. With, of course, looking at the development itself. So how do you look at the development? How do you make the unbuilt and the built kind of, you know, go hand in hand? So how we plant, how we look at water. So we have around 500 species of, you know, planting or landscaping we have done here. And they're all indigenous. So they all cater to, you know, they kind of act like, you know, the, the we have 60, 70% of uh, open area, which then allows water to trickle down, which then gives, make sure you have water for your, you know, future years. You don't want to create these highly dense areas and, you know, then have no water in the next 10 years, which is Bangalore's already sitting on a big water issue. So how do you kind of, and since we're large enough, you can kind of make, changes within. It's not that, you know, you, you are not limited by what the other people do. If you have a good enough sizable land, you can kind of kind of make changes. So Malhar was an effort in that. So how do you kind of make changes within a small ecosystem, which then can be very easily replicated. So Good Earth's always been wanting to, you know, all our information is available online. This and we have a lot of people coming and kind of look at how we have done this kind of, you know, place. So, yeah, that's been so interesting. Uh, so I, I heard you say about leads and how uh, you know, you can have a star rating, air conditioning system and still uh, get away despite having, you know, the worst possible design. So uh, do you think these kind of ratings have actually lost their intent and purpose? Oof. I don't think so. I think everything has a place in its, uh, in a D. So I, I think the ratings play a big role in kind of amplifying a certain element. I, I mean, it's better than not having anything, but I think I think we'll have to look at, I feel, we have to look at ratings in a more fundamental sense. Are we looking at design? Are we looking at more uh, simple fundamental principles and kind of giving points for that? Otherwise, it's mostly now, I mean, I feel it's more product oriented or more superficially oriented. But if ratings can go a little bit behind, I mean, a little bit below and look at the depth and the width of what a particular design, a particular business is doing, then it may make, make more sense. But I still feel there is value in rating because it still gives some amount of uh, you know, exposure to something which is good. I mean, having an energy star rated AC is better than not having a not an energy star rated AC, right? So it's still fine. So tell me a little bit about Good Earth's journey. How did Good Earth as a concept, as a company actually come about? Because it's so much easier to do what everybody is doing. It's so much easier not to be able to convince your, your buyer, uh, you know, on something which he doesn't, uh, isn't exposed to. So how did Good Earth actually come about with this? Yeah, that goes a little behind 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 my times, but I think it. I mean, I, I mean, I know the story that like how I was told, but I think in 1985, 86, there are a group of architects and engineers because that's also a critical piece. That it's not just it's a it's a motley group of different skill sets which kind of come together to create something like this. So I think they were all inspired by Laurie Baker. Laurie Baker is a architect who's who worked in Kerala with a lot of vernacular architecture, working with the local masons and local. Uh, you know, uh, material and mason. So they were kind of inspired by him and they they kind of went into business with that model, started as an NGO, then and as an NPO, and then realized more and more that unless you get into the whole stack that you design and develop and execute and maintain, because only then you understand the whole process. And uh, 
it started in 91 92 small communities kind of sprouted up and people i think some uh, initially they were a small group but then that kind of started the movement where they are referred and the word of mouth kind of spread and then over time we spread into multiple cities it started in kochi the whole uh, chapter started in kochi and then we had different people with their interests going to different places and then it's been that i mean the ethos and principle has stayed the same over the last 35 years but it's always been a you know an expression of vernacular in its certain sense you know how sustainability can tie into vernacular but what i would imagine it's not an easy task you know especially when you have um a common narrative which goes around uh which tends to give you a, a habitable house or an office without having to invest too much in it uh without having to bother about a lot of other things that you are obviously taken upon yourself to bo be bothered about how do you actually convince your end uh, consumer that what you're building even though it may be a little more expensive i'm not sure i'm assuming how is right. how does that add value yeah i think one is of course the overall feel of the place so when you come into a place like this you i mean what we generally heard from clients is it's it's a i mean they uh, aspirationally want to live in a place like this even if you're coming from a, from a city you it's kind of it's i mean i don't know if you've seen the visuals but it's mostly open there's lots of greenery in a way it's it's a kind of a resort so to answer your other question whether it's more expensive it is if you compare an apple to apple if you're buying a 3 bhk home somewhere else to a 3 bhk home with us it is going to be expensive but what the intangible is like we have lots of open space you're paying for the open space and some people see the value in that so a lot of the people who buy with us are you know look at their kids and their elderly parents being you know completely at ease which may be a decision you know a point at certain at a certain time but um, the other question is also it's not it's not we're not doing doing it as a you know like in a builder we have something called an fsi and far where we maximize the fsi or we maximize far to make the money out of it so it's also how you look at keeping the business what do you say modest or trying to make it profitable for us and also making it viable for an end product we're not trying to you know it's not a very high end it's not high end luxury villas or anything by any means the luxury is in its space it's is in its water its availability it's is in its you know the kind of flora and fauna which thrive that's the luxury here it's not a luxury in a you know from a swimming pool or a high end uh, you know fittings or stuff like that so i think there are lots of people who understand that nuance and that's the kind of thing and we are hoping that this kind of because we are trying to make it accessible we're hoping more people will kind of jump onto this bandwagon so I, I I keep repeatedly hearing from you open spaces, flora and fauna, the native wisdom, indigenous trees, in, indigenous plantations. Have you also um, you know made some kind of innovations in design or even I mean you're a, a civil engineer in terms of the structure of the units that you you create or is that focused on brick and mortar as as no, normally? No. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, we've been using a lot of brick all all these years and at malhar we realized brick also has so like any material has its pros and cons i mean you, if you look at it through its life cycle you'll see what are its cons and what are its pros and during malhar we looked at mud block so mud block is a big element uh, you know such stabilized mud block what we call is basically the earth from which you build the building is used to make your blocks so you hardly have any transportation costs it's baked in the sun you're not firing it so your carbon costs are minimal and that's been used for the last 10 years we've been building malha for the last 15 still it's still an ongoing project so we've been building malha for the last 15 years and we made almost i think 15 million blocks or 1.5 crore blocks which is made in situ uh, and that's of course a big um, uh, it's one one element of our building but the building itself like the way you design it no for example you make sure you don't have you have you have large windows on the north and south you don't have large windows maybe not the south but because in bangalore the south and west is where you have the most heat gain so how do you look at design like that so you have smaller windows there larger windows for light so you have you start with the design from you know that's the fundamental piece and then how that kind of leads to other materials so there are a lot of innovations from the structure as well Coming to your other point, uh, you spoke about indigenous, uh, you know, trees and all that. So when we started this journey, uh, 19, I mean, to, from 2000 onwards in Bangalore, 2015, 16, we did have problems of water. So we also took our learnings from water from Malhar and started applying it to lakes and other other developers and stuff like that. So it's something which we, a lot of things we learn is actually being kind of disseminated to, you know, the other folks, if they're willing to take that as of course. <laughs> I did also read uh, that uh, Good Earth was involved in the Hebagodi Lake rejuvenation yeah. project. Right. Is that correct? And and I think 
we've also acknowledged biocon as a um, as a company who have been working on right. that so are there any synergies there yeah yeah so i think they have a big lake behind biocon which they were looking because it's a massive lake and typically in bangalore lake rejuvenation means building stone or make it a concrete crucible and just left let in sewage water uh, what we did is we kind of looked at the you know how do how do we use plants and simple you know structures to kind of rejuvenate the lake and a lot of times you just need to let just do a little bit of intervention and let nature take its course that's that's the kind of work we did at biocon and it's been pretty good there i mean we've kind of looked at real estate and housing and then we that kind of led to another path of water because we had some water shortage here and then we looked at how scientifically we can look at water in you know how do we do hydrogeological studies again going back to the carrying capacity of the land and that led to another thing on food and then we got into restoration and regenerative agriculture so we're now doing a lot of regenerative agriculture in and around you know karnataka and kerala and maybe tamil nadu in the future so looking at how we can use agriculture as a means to fight climate change so you know because again that's another that's a that's a big topic altogether i want to dwell into that but we it is a part of sustainability right so when you look at how uh, we can uh, agriculture is a big part of how we can fight climate change so it, we've been working on permaculture principles natural farming principles and you know uh, interesting very interesting and also in fact we've also acknowledged um, uh, you know very small grassroots uh, organizations of uh, from the northeast of the country it's called td and their basis is permaculture and they're actually uh, reviving forests like for example you're doing uh, yeah. lake rejuvenation yeah. down south um td is focusing on um, on forest and forest rejuvenation um so i think there's a lot of work which is happening across the length and breadth of the country um but what according to you is uh, good earth's long term uh, vision for sustainability of course we've spoken about agriculture as well but um um well this is a nuanced question because when you're focusing on something which is beyond your profit incentive how do you uh, you know um, continue to work towards it our overall idea whether it's housing or food or water is looking at you know climate change, how we could tackle it through this. and there's no way we'll be able to implement all that so if we whatever business we kind of whatever ideas or initiatives we we, we do if we can show there is profit in it of this value in it then we are sure a lot of people will take this up right so and that's how so that's our long term plan it's a kind of we were also looking at how we can get into so even all our regenerative regenerative agriculture spaces are also places where other people can learn and kind of farmers who we work with where we do our projects are around us are also starting to get because they see the value in it so one is of course the yield and the money of it but also looking at the overall you know health of the land you know health of the soil so that's how it kind of you know we we see how we we can cascade all our efforts super super and one last parting question uh, prashant how was your experience being a part of sabera and being acknowledged by the sabera jury oh it's, it's it was fantastic i mean i really loved the experience of coming there i mean it was also great to be part of such a illustrious and prestigious group then we are very honored to be you know uh, honored by <laughs> sabera and we are hoping that you will keep up the good work we are hoping that a lot of your knowledge and learning can be shared with these smaller grassroots organizations in different parts of the country like i mentioned td that is working in um in darjeeling um right. and they've been working on permaculture and i think um, they've created quite a a model kind of a forest there uh, so i think that's the whole intent also of sabera to be able to connect these gaps that exist in silos in different parts of the country and i'm hoping that um we will see you again through the platform uh, to share some of your knowledge and share some of your projects as well thank you so Absolutely. much for thank you thank you so much for doing this with us